Hello, I'm uh, John Rowland. I volunteer here in the Stratosphere Chamber. And uh, I uh, originally started working at, uh, or volunteering at Brooklands in around 2014, which was just after the chamber had been reopened, as indicated by this uh, plaque over here. But uh, it was reopened after many years' work by many volunteers by Mary Stropes Rowe, who is uh, the older daughter of Barnes Wallace. Uh, and it says there on the 13th of March in 2014. Uh, the main reason I came here was because my father used to work here from 1959. He moved up here as a BC-10 stress engineer designing wings for the aircraft. Later on he moved into the TSR-2 program where he was a, one of the senior people on the design and the structures side. At, uh, and unfortunately when it was cancelled in 1964 he was uh, ordered to uh, manage part of the destruction of all the kits that was on site in terms of both the aircraft frames and indeed all the, uh, uh, the rigs that were being used to construct the aircraft. And uh, he and some of his colleagues were uh, required, shall we say, to uh, lead the destruction of all that equipment, which uh, was a great upset to everyone at the time. Okay, so let's go and have a look at what's uh, known as the control room or can be the communications room, uh, which is where basically all the experiments in here would have been managed. And uh, to get there, we have to go up a, some very steep steps. So here we are at the, the top of the stairs. Now, in, up here we have a large mezzanine area, none of which would have existed in the uh, original days. These were added when the, the education centre was put on. So all you would have is the entranceway into the uh, control room and the walkway that takes you into the chamber itself. As you go through the doors it always seems you're going into submarine because you have pressure door system to allow you to get through into the lower pressure areas. And as we go through here we come in into the control room itself <coughs> which has in many ways changed very little from its uh, days when it was fully operational. There is a certain amount of equipment which has gone missing when they closed the place down, but otherwise it looks very similar. And there's photographs on the wall here that show it as it was in probably 1950s, I would guess. And uh, it looks very similar, to, as, as I say, to what we have now. And in fact, recently we've been uh, trying to reinstall a few bits and pieces to make it look slightly more authentic. Basically, in, from in here, the key thing they were doing was monitoring the experiments that were going on in the chamber. <coughs> and from that point of view, this uh, section here shows a whole load of terminal blocks. And each of these blocks, which have got labelled up in different boxes, are correspond with <coughs> equivalent uh, terminals within the chamber itself. So all the appropriate equipment could be uh, attached to the test pieces in the chamber, particularly things like uh, for testing stress. And at this end, you would be able to connect to those pieces of kit and take the measurements. And uh, on the wall over there, you can see there are various recorders which would have been there to measure the temperatures that you're uh, at which the experiments were taking place. And uh, in those days, of course, it had to be recorded on pieces of paper because uh, we didn't have computers as such. And in terms of the, uh, there's an in and out board you can see here. There's uh, one person who I was uh, told about who uh, was a part of the production development area. And there's a name here which is Mr. S. Still. And uh, I'm told he was named, he's named by his family Stanley. So he's Stan Still. So as we move along here, there's basically there's some pieces of kit that have gone missing from this particular desk. However, you here have a temperature measuring device <coughs> which uh, allows you to take measurements of temperature at various points in the chamber. And underneath there is a, a set of uh, indicators with numbers related to different parts. Now, you may notice that there are four gearbox settings which are 11, 12, 13 and 14. And as it happens, uh, 13 and 14 still work. So if you look at the gauge, which is immediately above, you can see that it measures a temperature and it tells us today that it's sitting at uh, about eight, six to seven degrees, 
But the interesting point, I think, is the fact you have a range going up to 100, which uh, it couldn't be achieved. We could get up to 40. But actually, as you go down, we have goes down to minus 100. So, and you could achieve going down to about minus 70. So in terms of actually the fine control of the chamber, the, the section we move to here uh, actually covers the ability to have fine control over the temperature and the section that you're looking at here is the uh, pressure section. So there's a, in terms of getting a fine control, there is a, a knob here which rotates, which rotates a, a, uh, there's a rod that used to go down to the vacuum pumps and uh, as you turn that it would change the position on a valve in terms of releasing the pressure so you could actually have a very fine control over the actual pressure absolute pressure that's inside the chamber but also you have alt altimeters here which actually give you an indication of the equivalent in terms of feet which you would be flying at as you could say and then at the top here there is an item which would be recording the actual pressure the uh, pressure you're at with time to allow you to be able to correlate that then with the uh, temperatures and other readings that you're taking. And at the end here we have a, what is basically the controls for the circulation fans and uh, one can see out the window here, I'm not sure with the reflections, but there are two green motors on stands which are on the right hand side as we're looking at and of the chamber and there's another pair of those on the other side. So each of those have fans inside the ducts. There were four ducts around the outside of the chamber which allowed for the circulation of the air. Now each of those fan motors has a control on this panel which uh, in front of us here. So there was a, a, a coarse control which is the large wheel in the middle here which uh, unfortunately has disconnected with that which should be rotating there but unfortunately at the moment it doesn't. But then each of the individual fans has a fine control and as we can see here as you rotate the fine control there's a fan speed indicator which rotates similarly on each of the others. Now the point about having the fine control over the speed of the motor is that is how you could control the temperature because the air is required to actually circulate the air and the air is circulated through heat exchangers uh, and the heat exchangers will be at a fixed temperature but the speed of the air will actually govern the temperature of the air that will be flowing through them. Now that allows you to have fine control then over the actual temperatures that you're trying to gain within the chamber. The uh, technology in involved with uh, this device is 1950s and I don't know if you can see easily underneath here there's this very large device which is effect effectively a large variable resistor. Now if that was running today then at lower, te lower speeds I'm not sure I would be standing very close because you probably find that it would be glowing red hot to be able to, dis to actually distribute or remove the uh, energy from the fans. And as uh, indicated uh, in the, uh, the commentary we get when we come in here, the, uh, there's a start and stop button here, but the stop button is a large red button that you might have to hit in an emergency. So as we said, this allowed for the fine control of such things as the altitude or the pressure and the uh, temperature and speed of the fans that are going. The main equipment, however, in terms of the plant which we have out there, was controlled basically by the turning on and off by a, in a control room which is on the far side which doesn't exist anymore plus uh, individual controls on the individual bits of plant. Now to be able to communicate they had their own little communication system in here and th uh, there's a certain plugins you can find where you would plug in a headset so that they were allowed to could then talk to people uh, who are plugged into similar uh, plugs around the different areas of the, of, the, of the plant room. They also had a system which uh, we uh, believe it, they had in here which allowed for communications a bit further in terms of where the, the electricity substation is or indeed the actual main plant room. So we believe there are a number of these devices which were taken from the a naval environment which are self-powered telephones and I can't actually take this off because it's stop people removing it. However, having removed the dial, you would then 
while dial it up and the other end they see the light will come on and you then can have effectively a telephone communication but the key point is it doesn't use any power so you don't need a telephone exchange or anything so it's why it's called a self-powered telephone so that was one of the kind of telephone communications that they used around the place so i'm assuming that after the second world war the guy in charge here came from the Navy, so he probably had a stock of these sort of items. So they decided to put them in here as a way of using that and solving a problem. Okay, so on this side, there's basically some records that we have of one of the tests that they had done in 1959. And it says here that this was for the Vanguard test cabin. And uh, at the moment, the, the, uh, cab the piece of structure within the chamber is in fact a Vanguard cabin, although that was an operational one rather than a test one. But what we see here is the period of time that they were running 24 hours a day to do a particular test. So it appears here that they started about March the 6th, ran for 24 hours a day through to around uh, March the 14th. However, I would imagine that it was a various bits of running going before and afterwards on that. So they're looking here to probably do a pressure cycle every half hour maybe, and uh, at a fixed temperature, I would guess. So every, 20, every half an hour, you could, have, you could be able to simulate the equivalent of taking off and landing. And then you would be testing it effectively 24 hours a day until you e either broke something or you got the, the results that you were looking for. One of the things we find around in this place is that underneath the chamber there are various little cubby holes where things appear and uh, from that, that were probably left there many, many years ago. And one of these was uh, this instrument that I found uh, about two years ago. It, uh, it's a very fine pressure manometer and it says there it's in H2O, in other words it's in uh, inches of uh, water. Uh, so it would measure very little, very small differences in pressure. Now, when I found it, it was uh, rather battered and, and uh, covered in water stains. So I, I decided to may as well make it look reasonable. So we now display it up here as just a means of uh, uh, allowing people to see the kind of bits of kit that used to be around this place. So here on the wall here, we see a number of photographs taken presumably from the, the archives, uh, covering a lot of the bits of testing that was done in the place. Uh, I mean, including the, the famous trawler experiment, which uh, there's a lot of information about around the place. And then there's a whole load of different bits and pieces of kit, electrical systems and so on. And then the Vanguard test, which uh, we talked about at one point in terms of the, uh, the uh, records. So there's some picture records there of that testing going on. And from my point of view, uh, one of the more uh, uh, meaningful items here is the picture here of the scimitar so there's a scimitar aircraft in the chamber fully and being pushed in or out and in of the chamber there but uh, my connection with, uh, with Vickers is through my father and my father worked on the scimitar at uh, with Supermarine uh, at Hursley Park originally so that's near Winchester and uh, he was then moved on to working up, up here in the late 1950s so so the, the pictures there also then show a number of the other military aircraft which are, were tested in here. Having got to see uh, the chamber on site in originally about 1947, uh, about mid-1947 from what we can guess that uh, everything was more or less in place, then after that they had to construct the, the, well, the control room that were in here and the shed that went around it. Now, my understanding is originally the, the, they hadn't, didn't think that they would put a shed around the whole of the, uh, the chamber itself. However, um, it clearly wouldn't have lasted very long. Uh, in, indeed, we know that by late 1950s, there were problems uh, already in terms of the, uh, the insulation being uh, falling apart slightly. So they had to do a whole load of extra work uh, in terms of covering the chamber in, uh, in linen, and uh, also in the sheet materials at the bottom to prevent basically the whole of the, the, uh, uh, the insulation falling apart. Now, having put the shed up, it, it, in, uh, starting in 1947, they would have, uh, uh, it was another four years before they actually managed to get the, 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 site, the place in working order. 
Now, I'm not entirely sure what they were doing for those four years, apart from the construction work. However, there's a, and the plant would have to have been put into place. Uh, but I, I am convinced that there was an awful lot of work had to go in to commissioning the place. So if you have a door which is 25 foot high and you're trying to mate it onto a, uh, uh, the rest of the chamber, those, the mating parts have to be very, uh, well, they have to be vertical basically and very little allowances because if you can't mate those parts you can't actually take the air out. Now we know that they had problems with this during the life of the chamber which is why a number of modifications were made to actually try and make that process easier. Similarly, in terms of uh, commissioning the place, to be able to achieve minus 70 Celsius inside the chamber, now that would require a, uh, is a significant issue with respect to the refrigeration. Uh, in particular, the refrigeration here was designed to be a two cycle system. The first cycle would take it down, the temperature down to about minus 30, which is the point at which the uh, ammonia, which uh, is the, the main refrigerant, would start turning into a jelly. Now, you can't go any further than that or else the whole system will grind to a halt. So they had to design a two-stage system and the second stage was re at reduced atmospheric pressure, which prevented the ammonia from actually freezing, basically, and allowed them to get down to minus 70. But there was a significant balancing act that had to be uh, undertaken to allow you to take these temperatures down. And we know that they had problems with this, and I believe this is why they had uh, took quite so long to get from construction through to actually in, in service in 1951.